2 Corinthians. Huh? Yeah. 2 Corinthians. Paul's thorn. Um, and then I have up on the screen Isaiah 5, so you might want to go ahead and start making your way there, because we are going to end up there. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations there was given to me. Remember, Paul went to Jesus' seminary. He did not confer with the other apostles. He did not confer with flesh and blood. The things that Paul learned and the things that he teaches us in all of his epistles, he received as direct revelations from Jesus himself. And um, what that's, I mean, that's, you're talking right, you're going right to the head. You're going right to the source. And I've even had people... Um, one lady wrote to me who I could tell, obviously, she was being directly influenced by those who are following the Hebrew roots. And she had, she wrote me, and I guess, you know, I, I kind of wonder why she wrote me, because I don't know if she thought that I was going to agree with her or not, but she wrote me and said that she felt like she had a revelation that the Apostle Paul was a false apostle. And so, and, and that he was never recognized as an apostle by the other apostles, so therefore his doctrine was wrong. And I immediately detected Hebrew roots because I've read some of their websites and that's what some of them say. And it's because they don't like what Paul says. They don't like the doctrine that he teaches. He teaches the doctrine of grace without keeping the law. And they don't like that. They think that you have to keep the law, even though none of them ever do. They never keep the law. So I wrote her back and I said, well, Peter says here, and I gave her the scripture, Peter says to read Paul. Peter accepted him. Peter recognized his authority. And um, so I, that kind of brought her down a little bit. And I told her, I said, I perceive that you're getting fed some nonsense from some Hebrew roots people. My suggestion to you is, so call your cable company, have them shut your internet connection off and get your Bible out and read it. Because you're being influenced in too much of the wrong way. And uh, so anyway, um, where was it? Oh, yeah, Paul's doctrine did not come from Peter, did not come from James, did not come from anybody. It came from Jesus himself. And so with these revelations, Paul's nature, we know enough about Paul to know that he could ha he was at one time very arrogant, and very zealous for the law. He gave his lineage. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. It means son of the right hand. And I was zealous for the law. I knew the law better than anybody. And I was going to go kill all the Christians. And then Jesus met him on the road to Damascus. So he is given this thorn in his flesh to quieten him. To quiet him down. Bring his attitude down. Keep him from being so arrogant and being so unforgiving. Maybe your thorn, maybe the one that's, that God uses, a messenger of Satan that buffets you, maybe that thorn is there and remains there so that you are more forgiving. Let me ask you a question. How many times has God forgiven you? Every time. Every single time. What if you keep doing the same thing over again? Does he still forgive you? Yes. Every single time he forgives you. So what if somebody does something to us and they do it more than once? We forgive them because God has forgiven us. Okay? We forgive them. We may not want to, we may not feel like it, we may be angry, but we forgive them. So that's what Paul's thorn was all about. And he called it, in verse 7, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So, uh, and then he said, for this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. What exactly is the nature of the thorns that we bear? Let me go to... 
um, I sort of did a digest of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John doesn't mention this particular parable, but Matthew does, Mark does, and Luke does. Matthew 13, Mark 4, Luke 8. Um, these verses, these three places together teach us the scope of what thorns can be all about. And what I did was I digested them down. I, this is from the synoptic gospel. Synoptic means they look the same. Like a synonym, it means the same. Or it looks the same. Optic is how it looks. And that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Because they, if you read them, they are very, very close to one another in how they wrote. There are some, I learned this, and you learn these weird things in Bible college. One of the weird things I learned was that scholars, some of them believe that Matthew, Mark, and Luke actually copied their letter or their, their gospel story of Jesus from a, an original document that they assigned the letter Q. I don't know why they call it Q, but that's what they called it. And, but that document doesn't exist anymore. I don't believe that. I believe that God spake... And those men wrote down what God spake to them. But anyway, you have the cares of this world. That's what Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell you. These thorns represent the cares of this world or having your mind in the matters of this world. So let me just throw this out at you for a little while. We have... Services all week. We have Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night services. I try to do more than that by giving out Pastor Mike online Tuesday and Thursday, watch them in broadcast. Uh, sometimes a little extra if, if I can, if my schedule allows. I try to give out as much teaching time as is possible. But if you spend one day out of your week or one part of one day out of your week focused on God but the rest of your week is solely dedicated to the cares of this world and I, and I know everybody's got to get up we got to go to work we have a house to clean we have kids to take care of or whatever I get I'm not saying that's wrong but I'm saying that I think we have a disease in American churchianity of the one service syndrome. We go to one service and then the rest of the week we are very worldly people. We do, th we do what we participate in the world's amusements. We participate in the world's sins. We participate in in the activities of this world, and, and when I say this world, I mean lost people. We care more about ourselves than we do our soul. We care more about the pleasing of the flesh than we do the feeding of our souls. That, to me, says that you have thorns growing up in your life that are choking out that one service that you went to. That one service where you got this little milk and cookies sermonette. And you think that that's good enough for your religious experience. Oh, and the music was great. And there was a lot of clapping and a lot of dancing. And the light show was fantastic. And the coffee was good. And then the rest of the week is you are feeding your flesh, feeding the lust of your flesh. You care more about pleasing the senses than you do the feeding of your soul and the maintenance of your soul. You've got thorns that are choking out what little word you got at the beginning of that week. Okay, that's what that means. Cares of this world. Deceitfulness of riches. America is a wealthy nation. If you, if you consider 
that debt is wealth. Debt is not wealth. Amen? You understand what I'm saying? If you've got 10 credit cards maxed out, you may have a lot of stuff from those 10 credit cards, but you're not wealthy. You're impoverished because you're in debt. You're greatly in debt. Our nation is fiercely, scaringly so in debt. And we keep racking up more debt. But that's, that's the deceitfulness of riches. The deceitfulness of riches is I can have money or I can have all of these things. I'll worry about paying them off later. And I'm going to preach some more on debt this morning. But money deceives people. The love of money deceives people. A lot of things that go on in this world that are wrong, money or the love of money is the source of why that's wrong. Why do you think some people want, who are in public office want to be reelected? They may not get good pay and benefits from the job they have, they probably get better pay and benefits from large companies or privately owned companies who want to influence government contracts or want to influence this or that so that their company gets rich off of it and they're going to kick some of that back to these politicians. In some ways, that's legal. And guess who made the laws making that legal? The people who make the laws, who make it legal. That's the deceitfulness of riches. The lust of other things. Well, you can include practically everything that everybody lusts after. In Exodus 20, the 10th commandment is, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thy neighbor's wife, Thy neighbor's manservant, thy neighbor's maidservant, his ox or his ass or anything that belongs to thy neighbor, you should not covet it. Most, most TV advertising, magazine advertising, radio advertising and internet advertising does is nothing but about pleasing the lust of the eyes or the lust of the flesh. Come and get your fulfillment here, click on this website or go to this store. I watched, I made the mistake one night. I was watching the History Channel and I was watching a documentary about the history of the American hamburger. 11 o'clock at night and I am starving to death for a hamburger. Whopper commercials, fast food commercials. What do they do? They get you to want and lust after their product. Like you've got to have this product and nothing at home will satisfy that. You've got to go out somewhere. Now we have websites. We have places all over the country that are advertising. They're actually advertising marital infidelity. Advertising marital infidelity. One website, their slogan is have an affair. That's their slogan. And of course, their database got hacked into here a couple years ago, and one of the Duggar, the oldest Duggar boy, got caught. He was a regular, not only a regular visitor, but a regular participant in this website. Got busted over it, okay? And um, it, he's got thorns that will choke out the effects of the word of God. You follow me? Lust of other things. Whatever it is that you lust after, you lust after money, you lust after women, you lust after men, you lust after food, you lust after more money or more things or technology or whatever it is you lust after, that is a thorn. And if you're not careful, it'll choke out the word of God in your life. And all of this, God designs it so that it will, it will determine whether or not you are really saved or not. 
It'll determine that. How much thorns and what, what effect or what power they have in your life choking out the Word of God. That word, that phrase, choking out. Okay? Gloria's been coughing, Sterling's been coughing, others have been coughing. It's choking out their bronchial airways. How long can you go without food? Maybe 40 days. How long can you go without water? About three days. How long can you go without air? About three minutes. Okay? And this Bible is our food, it is our water, and it is our air. You cannot afford to have it choked out very long. You can't afford it. And then... The, it mentions the Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You get it from reading all three of them. Pleasures of this life. Pleasures of this life. Worldly amusements. Boy, they're coming down the parking lot way too fast. Whew, it's making me nervous. Anyway, pleasures of this life. Whether you like to sleep. You sleep in. Or... You just like to sit around and watch television all the time. Or you can, get hook, you can get hooked on internet videos just as bad as you can get hooked on television videos. Okay? You can get hooked in these things. And those are the pleasures of your life. Where David said, there are, at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. And we know at God's right hand is a book. You want pleasures in your life, you'll find them in your Bible. How many of y'all know that? You found things in this Bible that, I mean, it stirred your emotions, it gave you a sense of pleasure, it gave you a sense of well-being, it gave you, it gave, it, this Bible will please you in ways deeper than anything in this world can please you, and yet we systematically replace the Bible with pleasures of this life. We get our joy from the world and the things of the world rather than getting our joy from the word of God. The, a, man or, a man who took a Nazarite vow in the Old Testament, like Samson, like John the Baptist, like Samuel, like I believe Jesus, they took this Nazarite vow. There were things that they could not do. They, 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 they were to separate themselves from grapes, raisins, or wine. Well, some people get their pleasure from wine. So what is that? That means you're to get your joy. The joy of the Lord is your what? What does Samson have? Strength. He was to get, God was signifying, he was to get his joy from the strength that the Lord was giving him and not get his joy from the things that the world gives you. Amen? So those things, pleasures of this life, cares of this world, lust, deceitful, money, they will I'll say it like this. Money in a good church can make a good church go bad. Because they'll seek the riches. They'll Rick Warren boasts that when he started Saddleback Community Church in Orange County, California, he boasts of the fact that he went asking all of the lost people in that community to tell him what he has to do in order to get them in the door of his church. And when he found that out, he went and did it. And part of that was, we don't want to sing the old songs out of that hymn book anymore. We want to sing these new songs. We want the music to be more of a modern hip style than anything else. And we don't want to hear sermons that condemn us. So he cut them out. We don't want these sermons, that, these boring things about doctrine and about the ways of God. We want to understand. We want things that will help us and that will please us, that will satisfy us. And so that's what he did. He, in essence, built a church loaded with thorns that chokes the word of God out because he was seeking the people to be sitting in the seats in one of the wealthiest counties in America that's what he was seeking out. And that's what he got. He got campuses all over that county. He's got seeker 
friendly, purpose-driven churches all over the world. People come from all over the world to come and hear him teach them how they ought to build a church. And that's exactly what happened. They sought out the money. They sought out the people that are in the pews. They sought that out, and that's what they got. But all of that chokes out the word of God. The people in the pews, the pastor may have his heart right, but the people in the pews will choke the word out. I saw it happen in a pastor. He was solid King James. This church had a meeting on him and they said, you quit preaching that King James stuff or go find you another job. And so he quit preaching the King James stuff. And I feel bad. I've prayed for him to this day, hoping that the next church he got, he finally left that church. Lord, give him enough, give him enough power, give him enough of a stand to where he won't have to do that the second time. So let's go to Isaiah chapter, what did I say, chapter 5? Isaiah chapter 5. Here's what God says, Now I will sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved at the vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it. Gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower. Remember, vines, a vineyard. Jesus said, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Naboth had a vineyard. That vineyard represent your family. It could represent your church. It represents your life, your soul. It could represent a lot of things. But the vine, there's two vines. We have the vine of Christ, the true vine. In John 15, and then Deuteronomy 32, we have the vine of Sodom. In the vine of Sodom, the wine that it produces is full of poison. It's the poison of serpents. And so, the two, on the Bible translation issue, King James comes from one line of manuscripts, NIV, New American Standard, Holman Standard, comes from a different line of manuscripts. A line of manuscripts that had help from the Vatican in selecting the Greek text. Meanwhile, the King James translators fought the Vatican. They actively fought the Vatican. They did not want the Pope to have influence in their choice of the Greek text nor of the translation process. They knew it. They wrote about it. In the letters to the reader, they wrote about the influence of Romanish popery trying to influence them as they translate the Bible. Chris Pinto's talked about it. So those two vines there, he, he gave the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein and looked that it should bring forth grapes. And it brought forth wild grapes. No good. And now, verse 3, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah... Jerusalem is always going to be an example or a picture of the type of the church. Jerusalem is the center. Jerusalem is where the worship is. Jerusalem, men of Judah, I judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What, what could have done or what could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? He put the best vine in it. He built a wall around it a tower, a wine press, a very fruitful hill. The soil was magnificent. He did everything that he could do. Now you mark this down somewhere in your mind, in your heart, in your Bible or whatever. God will do everything for you except take over your mind. Your choice is always going to be yours. It's yours to make. It's your soul to keep for eternity or your soul to lose for eternity. God will provide everything necessary for you to succeed as a Bible-believing Christian and then as a saint of the Most High God to dwell in heaven for all of eternity. God will provide everything necessary. He leaves nothing out. Amen? And brings forth wild grapes. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes. Why did it do that? 
So verse 5, and now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the hedge thereof. A hedge, that's your protection. God will protect you from all the devils that want to eat you up. Do they? How many of you know that? You've had it. You've experienced it. Devil's trying to eat you up. Maybe they tried to do it this week to you. Maybe, they, maybe it's coming next week. But they are devourers. They devour flesh. They go after you. Try to destroy you. They try to... I talked to Michael about how... I asked him, how in the world did you get to the airport? Because the hotel that got bombed in Nairobi, he had visited that hotel the day before because it's the only place in town that makes the kind of tomato soup that he likes. They have a restaurant there and that's why they bombed it. He had just been there. And I won't tell you how he got to the airport. <laughs> but he got to the airport. And he sat in a plane for two hours because nothing was moving. They had shut down Nairobi for three days. They came to the radio station while he was there. The Catholics, Jehovah's Witness, or Seventh-day Adventists. They hate us. And they said, we're going to shut this radio station down. They don't like it, Mike. Okay? God watched over him. God protected him while he was there. I've been there. I know what the experience is like. God's protected us every single time. God watches over you. God protects you. God's built a hedge around you. That was Satan's complaint about Job. To God was, well, of course he worships you. You built a hedge around him. And Satan says, tear that, let me tear that hedge down. Let me get at him. And God says, you got it to do then. God knew the outcome. He knew what was going to happen. He wasn't afraid. But God builds a hedge around you to protect you. And he's done all of these good things for you. And yet you insist on being a wild grape and nothing more. You insist on having your little once a week time with God. And then the rest of the week is the pleasing of your senses and the pleasing of your flesh and participating in the pleasures of this world. You are a wild grape. So God says, I'm going to tear the hedge down of it shall be eaten up and break down the wall thereof and it shall be trodden down. Verse 6, and I will lay it waste, it shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and what? Thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain, no rain upon it. All of a sudden now, God's dried up the Bible. You ever experienced that one? You don't want to. Where God will dry up the Bible to you. You don't want to read it. You don't want to think about it you don't want anything to do with it you don't want that to happen I promise you you do not want that to happen for the vineyard verse 7 for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel and the men of Judah is his pleasant plant and he looked for judgment but behold oppression for righteousness but behold a cry he's looking for judgment judgments the word of God he's looking for the effect of of the word of God in a person's life. He's looking for the fruit of the spirit. He's looking for love, joy, peace, long-suffering, faith, gentleness. He's looking for those things to be manifested in your life. But all he sees is wild grapes. It's all he sees. Um, I say this quite a lot. But to the online folks, you can... Follow all the conspiracy theories. You can believe in the Illuminati. You can believe in that there's conspiracies everywhere. You can believe that government agents follow you around. You can believe anything you want that comes across the internet. But if you're lost, you will go get a mark in your right hand or in your forehead. I promise you. 
you're going to fall for the strong delusion. And it's, you're not, you're not going to escape it. If you think that your intellectual powers are strong enough to prevail against the wiles of the devil, you are already deceived. You're already deceived. It takes the word of God to defend your soul against the wiles of the devil and his fiery darts and nothing but. Um, turn to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 6. There are some people who don't like Hebrews chapter 6 so much that they have, in, in effect, eliminated the book of Hebrews completely out of their reading. They are these, what I, these so-called rightly dividers. And they say that only what Paul says has any relevance to us in this age. None of the rest of the Bible's for us. That's all for Israel, including the book of Hebrews. Well, I happen to think Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. But regardless of that, it's in my Bible. It's written for me. It's written to me, and it's a warning. It is a very clear warning. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. How many of you know somebody that used to go to church, grew up in church, and now won't touch it? They won't be anywhere near it. Okay? There are false brethren. There are fake Christians. There are temporary believers. They believed it when they were little. They went to a Bible camp. They prayed the prayer. But they don't live it. They don't believe it. They don't act it out. They want nothing to do with it. And outside of the grace of God, they're not coming back. Some do. Some do. Praise the Lord. But some, a lot, don't. And they use the excuse. And I knew somebody that used this excuse. I got saved when I was eight. That's all I need. Because they were told that. But. And I, I use this term atheist, lesbian, witches. They got saved or they say they got saved once. But now they've turned into atheist, lesbian, witches. They've gotten as far away from the gospel as you can possibly get. And I believe with some of them, God turns them over to a reprobate mind. And I believe what Peter said, the latter end shall, shall be with them worse than the beginning. And he puts that in the context of verse 7. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs, meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. There are those whom when God rains, the showers come down, the doctrine comes down, His word, where does rain come from? It comes from heaven. That's an example to us. His word's coming down to us, and with some, it does bring forth fruit. But then, verse 8, But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected, nigh unto cursing, whose end is to be burned. That what does that tell you? Bear the thorns. Bear the briars. You're rejected, cursed, and to be burned. Cursed and burned people are not people who are in heaven. You're not in heaven while you're being cursed. And... I'm going to clear something up. I, I, you would be surprised at the names that have taught this. 
the place of outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth is not a place in heaven that's reserved for the bad Christians. That's not heaven. That's hell. Place of outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. You go read Isaiah chapter 66. Isaiah 66 and you'll find that out. So what are you going to do about your thorns? Well, Jesus, they took Jesus and they platted a crown of thorns on his head and he took it to the cross. That's where your thorns need to be. At the cross. Okay? They are sins. They are pleasures of this life. They are things of this world that seek to choke out the effects of the word of God in your life. Take them to the cross and let Jesus have them. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this good time. Thank you, Lord, for the doctrine that comes to us from heaven only. Father, I don't say I got everything right. I don't think, God, that everything that I say and everything that I believe is 100% true. But I know this book is right in everything that it says. And Father, my hope, my prayer is that those who are listening today, whatever their thorns are, Father, they're there for a reason. They're there to keep us humble. They're there to keep us, keep our mouth shut. They're there, Lord, to remind us that we have been forgiven of many things and that we are to forgive others of many things. But Father, help us to never let those thorns choke out the power of this book in our lives. Let this book do in us what it does best. That is, make us fruitful for your kingdom and your glory. Say, God, you delight in a fruitful garden. You've planted us well. You've done everything right, Father. It's not your fault. It's ours. As Father, we beg you, God, Help us to destroy the thorns that are in our life. And once they're gone, help us to re be, remember they'll come back. And we'll be down on our knees once again. Plow us up, God. Take those thorns out. Prune us, Father. Clean us up. Make us your disciples, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen.